Hello again. We're ready for part two of Justin Martyr's first apology to the Roman Senate. Now, before we get started, uh, I would just like to remind you that in uh, the end of uh, chapter 16, which we just finished in part one, uh, he says, and every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And as to those who are not living pursuant to these his teachings and are Christians only in name, we demand that all such be punished by you. So that is quite telling. Um, it shows that there were other kinds of Christians at that time and it shows that uh, Justin Martyr was maybe a really extremely conservative type of Christian and uh, that there were others who were uh, less conservative and, and maybe um, a little uh, less strict with their teachings. Now, just as an overview of what we read about Justin so far, first of all, he says that Christianity is a philosophy which should be treated equally fair with the other philosophies. It was his point. And he also talks about the, how the demons defiled women and corrupted little boys and how they made up all of these Greco-Roman gods to uh, confuse people and to cause the people to serve them instead of God. And that is um, pretty closely following the book of First Enoch, which you'll find in the Deuterocanonical books, um, or what some people would, would call the Apocrypha. Um, and he also says Socrates spoke against the demons, and that's why he was killed. And he talks a lot about everlasting punishment in fire, and um, the uh, he talks a lot against the use of images of any kind. And he says that God wants temperance, justice, and faith, and those kinds of things are better than sacrifice. Um, and he says, in a demons entice men to lust and vice, and God's kingdom is not of this world. God is an unchangeable, eternal God, and uh, the, the demons misrepresent Christ, and uh, they share common goods together. They live in a co communal way. And um, they pray for their enemies. They live uh, in chastity, which means no sex at all. And um, he talks a lot about uh, even looking at a woman in lust is, is adultery. And uh, you should store up treasure in heaven. This is like Matthew chapter 5. The, the Sermon on the Mount, taking it quite literally, um, and that the wicked are punished in everlasting fire. So, but what I want to take away from this is that there were other kinds of Christians who Justin Martyr did not like, who he considered not good enough. Okay, so if we look at Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, says the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. And if you look at... Uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, Jesus says, And you shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flocks shall be scattered abroad. But after I rise again, I will go before you into Galilee. So, 
Uh, the sheep being scattered, you could also see that as Christianity itself, that um, since the shepherd was struck, the sheep did become scattered, and there were many different flavors of Christians at that time. It wasn't until uh, the 4th century, 325, when the Roman Emperor Constantine held a council at Nice uh, that to, to bring the bishops together to come up with a common Catholic or universal faith for Christians that they should all believe in one thing, that he regulated Christian doctrine and unified Christianity and forced it upon others on pain of death. Okay, but that's when Christianity became, it, it really became two, because it, at first they, they made this doctrine at the Council of Nice, and then they ended up just killing everybody that disagreed with them, called them heretics, killed them. And then there was, uh, along the side of the Catholic Church, there was other dissenting uh, faiths of Christians that kind of lived in secret alongside of it and and we see different um, manifestations of it in history like the Waldenses, the Hussian uh, uh, Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, Wycliffe, um, you see all these glimpses of this counter 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 christian culture counter to the roman church and then of course after the 11th century you have the eastern church so um you know in this first century we see the same thing we see uh, different flavors of christianity out there except they're all living in secret so we only see glimpses of who they are You'll see uh, the Apostle John, he was, he was quite um, conservative. He kept the Jewish festivals and the Sabbath, but he met with other followers of, say, Paul, who, um, or his followers met with followers of Paul, who did not keep the festivals. And they, they met together, and they ended up just agreeing to disagree. And that's where they stood. They, they weren't uh, hostile towards each other. Uh, they were uh, considered each other brethren who lived in different ways, basically. Um, so with that being said, we'll carry on now with Justin Martyr, First Apology, starting in Chapter 17. So here's where we left off here at the end of chapter 16, Justin Martyr, first apology to the Roman Senate. And he's and as to those who are not living pursuant to these his teachings and are Christians only in name, we demand that all such be punished by you. And I don't think he was actually demanding it but he's just showing that uh, um, not all the people out there calling themselves Christians represent him and his people so it just shows there's other kinds of Christians out there that he disagrees with so now in chapter 17 these are very small chapters but there's 68 of them <laughs> so I think the chapters are divided into uh, topics, I suppose. So, chapter 17, Christ, caught, Christ taught civil obedience. And everywhere we more readily than all men endeavor to pay to those appointed by you the taxes, both ordinary and extraordinary, as we have been taught by him. For at that time some came to him and asked him if one ought to pay tribute to Caesar. And he answered, Tell me whose image does the coin bear? And they said, Caesar's. 
And again he answered to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Once to God alone we render worship, but in other things we gladly serve you, acknowledging you as kings and rulers of men, and praying that with your kingly power you be found to possess also sound judgment. But if you pay no regard to our prayers and frank explanations, we shall not suffer loss, since we believe, or rather indeed are persuaded, that every man will suffer punishment in eternal fire according to the merit of his deed, and will render account according to the power he has received from God, as Christ intimated when he said, To, God, to whom God has given more, of him shall more be required. Chapter 18, Proof of Immortality in the Resurrection For reflect upon the end of each of the preceding kings, how they died the death common to all. So reflect upon the end of each of the preceding emperors, how they died the death common to all, which, which if it issued in, in, in insensibility, would be a godsend to all the wicked. But since sensation remains to all who have ever lived, and eternal punishment is laid up for the wicked, see that you neglect not to be convinced, and to hold as your belief that these things are true. For let even necromancy and the divinations you practice, necromancy is uh, communicating with the dead, and divination is uh, conjuring up spirits. Okay, So these things you practice by immaculate children and evoking of departed human souls and those who are called among the magi dream senders and assistant spirits, familiar spirits, and all that is done by those who are skilled in such matters. Let these persuade you that even after death souls are in a state of sensation and those who are seized and cast about by the spirits of the dead whom all call demonics or madmen or what you repute as oracles both of Amphilochus, Dodana, Pytho and as many others such as exist. So these are famous uh, uh, seancers and how they act crazy when they talk to the dead. Um, and the opinions of your authors, Empedocles and Pythagoras, Plato and Socrates, and the pit of Homer, and the descent of Ulysses, to inspect these things, and all that has been uttered of a like kind. Such favor as you grant to these, grant also to us, who not less but more firmly than they believe in God, since we expect to receive again our own bodies, though they be dead and cast into the earth. For we maintain that with God nothing is impossible. The resurrection is possible. And to any thoughtful person would anything appear more incredible than if we were not in the body and someone were to say that was possible, that from a small drop of human seed, bones and sinews and flesh be formed into a shape such as we see. For let, us now, let this now be said hypothetically, if you yourselves were not such as you are now, and born of such parents, and causes, and one were to show you human seed and a picture of a man, and were to say with confidence that from such a substance, such a being could be produced. Would you believe before you saw the actual production? No one will dare to deny that such a statement would su surpass belief. In the same way, then, you are now incredulous, because you have never seen a dead man rise again. But as at first you would not have believed it possible that such persons could be produced from the small drop, and yet now you see them. Thus produced, 
so also judge that it is not impossible that the bodies of men, after they have been dissolved and like seeds resolved into the earth, should in God's appointed time rise again and put on incorruption. For what power worthy of God those imagine who say that each thing returns to that from which it was produced, and that beyond this not even God himself can do anything. We are unable to conceive, but this we see clearly, that they would not have believed it possible that they could have become such and produced from such materials as they now see both themselves and the whole world to be. And that is better to believe even what is impossible to our own nature and to men than to be unbelieving like the rest of the world we have learned. For we know that our Master Jesus Christ said, What is impossible with men is possible with God. And fear not them that kill you, and after that can do no more. But fear him who after death is able to cast both soul and body into hell. And hell is a place where those are to be punished who have lived wickedly, and who do not believe that those things which God has taught us by Christ will come to pass. Heathen Analogies to Christian Doctrine And the Sibyl and Histapses said that there should be a dissolution by God of things corruptible. And the philosophers called Stoics teach that even God himself shall be resolved into fire. And they say that the world is to be formed anew by this revolution. But we understand that God, the creator of all things, is superior to the things that are to be changed. If therefore on some points we teach the same things as the poets and philosophers whom you honor, and on other points are fuller and more divine in our teaching, and if we alone afford proof of what we assert, why are we unjustly hated more than all the others? For while we say that all things have been produced and arranged into a world by God, we shall seem to utter the God doctrine of Plato. And while we say that there will be a burning up of all, we shall seem to utter the doctrine of the Stoics. And while we affirm that the souls of the wicked, being endowed with sensation even after death are punished, and that those of the good being delivered from punishment spend a blessed existence, we shall seem to say the same things as the poets and philosophers. And while we maintain that men ought not to worship the works of their hands, we say the very things which have been said by the comic poet Meander and other similar writers, for they have declared that the workman is greater than the work. And when we say also that the Word, who is the first birth of God, was produced without sexual union, and that He, Jesus Christ, our Teacher, was crucified and died and rose again, and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those whom you esteem sons of Jupiter. For you know how many sons your esteemed writers ascribe to Jupiter, Mercury, Mercury, the interpreting word and teacher of all, Asclepius, who, th who though he was a great physician, was struck by a thunderbolt and so ascended to heaven, and Bacchus too, after he had been torn limb from limb, and Hercules, when he had committed himself to the flames to escape his toils, and the sons of Leda and Dioscuri, and Persis, son of Danae, and Bellerphon, who, th though sprung from mortals, rose to heaven on the horse Pegasus. For what shall I say? Ariadne, and those who, like her, have been declared to be set among the stars. And what of the emperors who die among yourselves, whom you deem worthy of deification, and in whose behalf you produce someone who swears he has seen the burning Caesar rise to heaven from a funeral pyre? 
And what kind of deeds are recorded of each of these reputed sons of Jupiter? It is needless to tell to those who already know. This only shall be said, that they are written for the advantage and encouragement of youthful scholars, for all reckon it an honorable thing to imitate the gods. But far be such a thought concerning the gods from every well-conditioned soul, as to believe that Jupiter himself, the governor and creator of all things, was both a parricide and the son of a parricide, and that, being overcome by the love of base and shameful pleasures, he came into Ganymede and those many women whom he had violated, and that his sons did like actions. But as we said above, wicked devils perpetuated these things, we have learned that those only are deified who have lived near to God in holiness and virtue, and we believe that those who live wickedly and do not repent are punished in everlasting fire. Moreover, the Son of God called Jesus, even if only a man by ordinary generation, yet on account of his wisdom is worthy to be called the Son of God. For all writers call God the Father of men and gods. And if we assert that the Word of God was born of God in a peculiar manner, different from ordinary generation, let this, as said above, be no extraordinary thing to you, who say that Mercury is the angelic Word of God. But if anyone objects that he was crucified in this also, he is on par with those who reputed sons of Jupiter of yours, who suffered as we have now enumerated, for their sufferings at death are recorded to have been not all alike, but diverse, so that not even by peculiarity of his sufferings does he seem to be inferior to them, but on the contrary, as we promised in the preceding part of this discourse, we will now prove him superior, or rather have already proved him to be so. For the superior is revealed by his actions. And if we even affirm that he was born of a virgin, accept this in common with what you accept of Perseus. And in that we say that he made whole the lame, the paralytic, and those born blind, we seem to say what is very similar to the deeds said to have been done by Asclepius. And that this may now become evident to you. So he's just talking about all these Greek and Roman gods doing all these things. So why is it so hard to believe that Jesus did those things, or similar things? Okay, and he also went on saying that if a man can be born of a drop and turn into a man, then how can a, the dead not be raised from the dead? That was another good point he made. <clears throat> the argument, and that this may now become evident to you, firstly, that whatever we assert in conformity with what has been taught us by Christ and by the prophets who preceded him are alone true and are older than all the writers who have existed that we claim to be acknowledged, not because we say the same things as these writers said, but because we say true things. And secondly, that Jesus Christ is the only proper Son who has been begotten by God, being His Word and the first begotten, and power and becoming man according to His will, He taught us these things for the conversion and restoration of the human race. And thirdly, that before he became a man among men, some, influenced by demons before mentioned, related beforehand through the instrumentality of the poets, those circumstances as having really happened, which having fictitiously devised, they narrated in the same manner as they have caused to be fabricated the scandalous reports against us of infamous and impious actions, of which there is neither witness nor proof. We shall bring forward the following proof. 
In the first place, we furnish proof because though we see things similar to what the Greeks say, the Greek philosophers, we are only are hated on account of the name of Christ. And though we do no wrong, are put to death as sinners. Other men in other places worshipping trees and rivers and mice and cats and crocodiles and many irrational animals, nor are the same animals esteemed by all, but in one place one is worshipped and another in another, so that all are profane in the judgment of one another on account of their not worshipping the same objects. And this is the sole accusation you bring against us, that we do not reverence the same gods as you do, nor offer to the dead libations and savor of fat and crowns for their statues and sacrifices. For you very well know that the same animals are with the same esteemed gods, with others wild beasts, and with others sacrificial victims. And secondly, because we, who out of every race of man used to wor worship Bacchus, the son of Samel, and Apollo, the son of Latona, who in their loves with men did such things as it is shameful even to mention, and Prosper Prosperpine and Venus, who were maddened with love of Adonis, and, who and whose mysteries also you celebrate, or Esculapius, or some one or other of those who are called gods, have now, through Jesus Christ, learned to despise these, though we be threatened with death for it, and have de dedicated ourselves to the unbegotten and impassable God, of whom we are persuaded that never was he goaded by lust of Antiope, or such other women, or of Ganymede, nor was rescued by that hundred-handed giant whose aid was obtained through Thetis, nor was anxious on this account or that her son Achilles should destroy many of the Greeks because of his concubine Bresius. Those who believe these things we pity, and those who invented them we know to be devils. And thirdly, because after Christ's ascension into heaven, the devils put forward certain men who said that they themselves were gods, and they were not only not persecuted by you, but even deemed worthy of honors. There was a Samaritan, Simon, he's in the book of Acts, a native of the village called Giru, who in the reign of Claudius Caesar, and in your royal city of Rome did mighty acts of magic by virtue of the art of the devils operating in him. He was considered a god, and as a god was honored by you with a statue, which statue was erected on the river Tiber between two bridges and bore this inscription in the language of Rome, Latin, Simony Dio Sancto, which means to Simon, the holy God. And almost all the Samaritans, and even a few of other nations, worship him and acknowledge him as, a fir as the first God. And a woman, Helena, who went about with him at that time, and had formerly been a prostitute, they say is the first idea generated by him. And a man, Meander, also a Samaritan of the town of Capertea, a disciple of Simon, and inspired by devils, we know to have deceived many while he was in Antioch. By his magical art, he persuaded those who adhered to him that they should never die, and even now there are some living who hold this opinion of his. And there is Marcion, a man of Pontus, who is even at this day alive and teaching his disciples to believe in some other God greater than the Creator, 
and he, by the aid of the devils, has caused many of every nation to speak blasphemies and to deny that God is the maker of this universe, and to assert that some other being greater than he has done greater works. All who take their opinions from these men are, as we aforesaid, called Christians, just as those who do not agree with the philosophers and their doctrines have yet in common with them the name of philosophers given to them. So just as some philosophers who disagree with, disagree with the philosophers, so we also have Christians disagreeing with the Christians. And there's these crazy Christians running around with these crazy ideas from devils. And whether they perpetuate those fabulous and shameful deeds, the upsetting of the lamp, the promiscuous intercourse, and eating human flesh, we know not. So we don't know what they do, whether they do these things or not. But we do know that they are neither persecuted nor put to death by you, at least on account of their opinions. But I have a treatise against all the heresies that, I, that have existed, already composed, which if you wish to read it, I will give to you. Now, he goes on to other things. He says, okay, <clears throat> but as for us, we have been taught that to expose newly born children is the part of wicked men. And this we have been taught lest we should do anyone an injury and lest we should sin against God. First, because we see that almost all so exposed, not only the girls, but also the males, are brought up in prostitution. So what is this all about? Okay, here we're going to take a quick look at something. We're going to learn something here about ancient Greece. <clears throat> Infant aside. Infanticide, infant homicide, is the intentional killing of infants or offspring. Infanticide was a widespread practice throughout human history that was mainly used to dispose of unwanted children. Its main purpose being the prevention of resources being spent on weak or disabled offspring. Unwanted infants were normally abandoned to die of exposure but in some societies they were deliberately killed. So, um, so what they're doing is exposing their children, unwanted children, would be just left out in the forest or, on, or somewhere in particular and left to die. So what Justin is saying is that these exposed children, it's a common practice in Rome at this time, and these exposed children, male and female, most of them are brought up in prostitution. And as the ancients are said to have reared herds of oxen or goats or sheep or grazing ho horses, so now we see you rear children only for this shameful use. And for this po pollution, a multitude of females and hermaphrodites and those who commit unmentionable iniquities are found in every nation. And you receive the hire of these and duty and taxes from them, whom you ought to ex exterminate from your realm. And anyone who uses such persons, besides the godless and infamous and impure intercourse, may possibly be having intercourse with his own child or relative or brother. Because uh, these children that were exposed and brought up in prostitution, the people having sex with them may be having sex with their own child or brother or sister. And there are some who prostitute even their own children and wives, and some are openly mutilated for the purpose of sodomy. Yikes. 
and they refer these mysteries to the mother of the gods. So this is the, the practice of the mother of the gods. And along with each of those whom you esteemed gods, there is a painted a serpent. A great symbol and mystery. Indeed, the things which you do openly and with applause, as if the divine light were overturned and extinguished, these you lay to our charge, which in truth does no harm to us, who shrink from doing any such things, but only to those who do them and bear false witness against us. For from among us, the prince of the wicked spirits is called the serpent, and Satan, and the devil. And as you learn by looking into our writings, and that he would be sent into the fire with his host, and the men who follow him, and would be punished for an endless duration, Christ foretold. For the reason why God has delayed to do this is his regard for the human race. For he foreknows that some are to be saved by repentance, some even that are perhaps not yet born. In the beginning he made the human race with the power of thought and of choosing the truth and doing right, so that all men are without excuse before God, for they have been born rational and contemplative. And if anyone disbelieves that God cares for these things, he will thereby either insinuate that God does not exist, or he will assert that though he exists, he delights in vice, or exists like a stone, and that neither virtue nor vice are anything. But only in the opinion of men these things are reckoned good or evil. And this is the greatest profanity and wickedness, is to think that these things are only good or evil in the opinion of men. Right? And again, we fear, to ex we fear to expose children, lest some of them be not picked up but die, and we become murderers. But whether we marry, it is only that we may bring up children, or whether we decline marriage, we live in continuity, and that you may understand that promiscuous intercourse is not one of our mysteries. One of our number, a short time ago, presented to Felix the governor in Alexandria a petition craving that permission might be given to a surgeon to make him a eunuch. For the surgeons there said that they were forbidden to do so this without the permission of the governor. And when Felix absolutely refused to sign such a permission, the youth remained single and was satisfied with his own approving conscience and the approval of those he, who taught as he did. And it is not out of place, we think, to mention here Antinous, who was alive but lately, and whom all were prompt through fear to worship as a god, though they knew both who he was and what his origin was. Was Christ not a magician? But lest anyone should meet us with the question, what should prevent that he whom we call Christ, being a man born of men, performed what we call his mighty works by magical art, and by this appeared to be the Son of God? We will now offer proof, not trusting mere assertions, but being of necessity persuaded by those who prophesied of him before these things came to pass. For with our own eyes we behold things that have happened and are happening just as they were predicted. And this will, we think, appear even to you the strongest and truest evidence. Well, this is going to get good. So he's going to talk about the Hebrew prophets prophesying about Christ. And Justin is quite well educated in, in all the philosophies 
of the Greeks and the Romans and in the Hebrew prophets. So it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, even uh, students of philosophy should study Justin. He, he's giving all this inside information about the philosophers and about the gods and things that Romans believed. Okay, of the Hebrew prophets. There were then among the Jews certain men who were prophets of God, through whom the prophetic spirit published beforehand things that were to come to pass, ere ever they happened. And their prophecies, as they were spoken, and when they were uttered, the kings who happened to be reigning among the Jews at several times carefully preserved in their possession. And when they had been arranged in books by the prophets themselves in their own Hebrew language, and when Ptolemy, king of Egypt, formed a library and endeavored to collect the writings of all men, he heard also of these prophets and sent to Herod, who was at that time king of the Jews, requesting that the books of the prophets be sent to him. And Herod the king did indeed send them, written as they were, in the foresaid Hebrew language. And when their contents were found to be unintelligible to the Egyptians, he again sent and requested that men be commissioned to translate them into the Greek language. And when this was done, the books remained with the Egyptians, and, when, and where they are until now. They are also in the possession of all Jews throughout the world, but they, though they read, do not understand what is said, but count us foes and enemies, and like yourselves they kill and punish us whenever they have the power, as you can well believe. For in the Jewish war which lately raged, Bar Kokobus, the leader of the revolt of the Jews, gave orders that Christians alone should be led to cruel punishments unless they would deny Jesus Christ and utter blasphemy. In these books, then, the prophets, we found Jesus, our Christ, foretold as coming, born of a virgin, growing up to a man's estate, and healing every disease and every sickness, and raising the dead, and being hated, and unrecognized, and crucified, and dying, and rising again, and ascending into heaven, and, and being, and being called the Son of God, we find it also predicted that certain persons should be sent to him into every nation. No, certain persons should be sent by him into every nation to publish these things, and that rather among the Gentiles than among the Jews, men should believe in him. And he was predicted before he appeared, first five thousand years again before, and again three thousand, then two thousand, then one thousand, yet again eight hundred, for in the succession of generations prophets after prophets arose. So now Justin is a little weak on his history, first of all, um, he's talking up here, he's talking about the, the Egyptians collecting a li library and all the writings of the Hebrew prophets. That wasn't Herod the Great. Um, that was um, earlier than that, that that happened. I think um, the date that I remember is about 300 B.C. And he's talking about the Septuagint Bible. And that is a, a Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. So he's got the story sort of correct, but the timeline, he's, got, he's off on the timeline of that. And also the 5,000 years. Um, Adam, if you figure out the, uh, the genealogy lists in the Bible, Adam appears to have lived uh, somewhere around 3,800 uh, BC. So right now Justin Martyr is in 120 AD. So it would be Adam would have been 3,800 years before. And so that would have been here, 3,000. 
and it was more about Moses was about uh, 12 or 1300 BC so that would have been the first prophet really that um, recording in the books and then uh, the other prophets would have been about uh, maybe 700 BC 600 BC um, 500 BC and that would have been the, the times of the prophets so he has that off a little bit but I mean you know they didn't have the access to history like we do okay Christ was predicted by Moses I think we're uh, getting uh, quite long into it here so I think we're gonna cut it off here for part two um, he's getting into uh, he's gonna get into um, Moses Isaiah Jeremiah all kinds of stuff uh, in the, the prophets okay utterances of the father utterances of the son we could even look up some of these verses it should be pretty good stuff and this is will be like you know it's not necessarily completely accurate especially on things like history but what was a Christian taught in this time and Justin Martyr was a particularly zealous Christian so what kind of knowledge did he have of the scriptures it would be interesting to see and um, what what were they interpreting uh, maybe aside from uh, maybe progressing on from what Jesus taught or what the Apostles taught what else are they looking at here it would be interesting to look at He's going to lay it all out for the Roman Senate, the whole thing about the prophets and Jesus and Christianity and what it is. Um, it's pretty good. And then what happened is at the end, <clears throat> he actually convinced the Senate. And at the end of this article here, they give the... Um, at the end of this article, there's the epistles of Adrian and Anton, Antoninus and uh, Marcus Aurelius uh, these epistles of um, ending the persecution to the Christians on the Christians so his letter actually worked for a while until another emperor came along and then Justin wrote a second apology so he's quite an interesting character and there is a book um, Justin in this uh, video that we were reading he did mention a book that he wrote about the heresies and describing all the heresies well there is a book that is Justin talking about heresies he's talking about all the philosophers and the types of things that they do the practices they do and uh, some of the other Christian heresies that were around at the time so I don't know why that book isn't really considered accurate by the scholars to be his book but um, that book does exist I just don't know if it, perhaps it's the a counterfeit of it or if it's the actual book that he wrote <clears throat> but I remember reading that book it's quite interesting it's it's kinda old and mm, it's it's all about the practice of the philosophers back at that time which is kind of irrelevant now to us um, unless maybe you know some weird people who are into that stuff nowadays may do some of those things but for the most part we we really I don't know anything about it so anyway so we'll carry on here um, chapter 32 in the next session okay well this is the end for of part two thank you for watching uh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this video. Thank you.